Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Granskog and I'll present our paper called Neural Scene Graph Rendering. So before we start, I just want to set your expectations straight. So the results we show in this presentation are of lower visual fidelity than typical SIG graph rendering talks. And this is because all of our outputs are entirely generated by neural networks, which rely on our neural scene graph. I just want to mention this because the next few slides will focus on the longer term vision and I still want to keep you grounded. So let's start with the vision for this work. If you consider a traditional graphics rendering pipeline, we start with a scene consisting of meshes with materials and some lights to illuminate the scene, and then a camera to frame the image that we want to render. The artists have a lot of control over this part, and there are plenty of 3D tools for building scenes in a fairly intuitive way. The scenes are then given to some renderer to produce the image by simulating or approximating the light transport in the scene. Now on the other hand we have this other parallel track that has appeared in deep learning. Here we learn rendering from data. For example we can train a GAN where the neural scene representation represents the latent variables and the neural renderer is the generator network. And these can then produce beautiful believable images of human faces for example. And it's quite hard to tell it's a fake image unless you look very very closely. If we compare this to a human face generated using the traditional rendering pipeline, one looks more believable than the other. And this traditionally produced image took many many years of research on uh, figuring out how to render humans accurately. And while it looks good, it isn't as realistic as the neural approach, which just relied on a ton of data, a cleverly designed uh, architecture and training approach. However, the problem is uh, what if you want to change the neural output to something that's not available in the training data? For example, what if the director of a movie comes to you and says that they want to render alien faces that are entirely blue? This is just not gonna be in your data set. In the traditional approach, we have a scene graph consisting of meshes and materials where we can easily control the parameters. So we need to somehow instill the same degree of artistic freedom into the neural approach by introducing some control. And simultaneously we need the representation and renderer to generalize to unseen scenarios, both in terms of scale and variety. And this becomes even more important if we would like to create a bridge between the two approaches. So the ultimate goal here is that you would be able to render some parts using a neural network, and some using a traditional primitives. For example, difficult stuff like hair, fur and faces could be rendered using the neural renderer instead of the traditional one. And then the representation acts as the interface between the two, ensuring that both of them receive the same information. So in this work we decided to focus on how do you go from the traditional scene representation directly to a neural scene representation and then render that representation with a generator network. Also, while in this work we focus on converting graphic scene graphs into neural scene representations, there is technically nothing that would prevent us from extracting materials and geometry from photographs and using those in the scene graph. Of course, this is assuming we have the data. So after all that talk, let's bring this slide back up again to reset your expectations so we can get going. So here is a video where I construct a scene using this user interface which provides parameters that exist in typical 3D applications. We can even render the scenes at an interactive rate using our method. And you can see that we are able to easily move and adjust the materials of objects and the results are stable. Another advantage of this scene representation is that we can produce videos such as this one. You could even imagine that a small sprite-based video game could be rendered entirely using this setup. So then let's first look at the traditional scene representation, which is a classical scene graph. So in a typical 3D content creation application, we have some objects in the scene represented as triangle meshes, and these are transformed in various ways and have some materials applied to them. 
The classical scene graph is this hierarchical structure where the same transformations and materials can be applied to many objects simultaneously. And ideally our neural scene representation should be just as scalable, controllable and easy to understand. Here is an illustration of the scene representation we use. Next we'll go through this uh, step by step, but you can see that at the bottom we have a set of learnable geometry and material representations which are transformed in the scene graph. So first, each geometric primitive is represented by a vector representation that we learn from data. To transform the geometry representation, we multiply it with encoded linear transformation matrices that can represent different transforms. For example, to first translate the teapot, we would multiply it with a n by n high dimensional neural translation matrix and then to rotate it, we would extract a neural rotation matrix and multiply the representation again. This then produces another geometry representation vector, and we will discuss how to produce the neural transformation matrices in a second. Similarly, materials are also represented by learnable vectors, and we can also modify these with other high dimensional linear transformations to, for example, first change the color and then shift its hue. In all our results shown, we have set M and N to 32. Then to assign a material to a geometric primitive, we concatenate the two representations together, and this result is then given to our neural renderer. So now let's look at how we produce our linear neural transformation matrices. We're typically provided a 4x4 transformation matrix from the user, this is commonly available in video games and in 3D applications. We encode this using an MLP into this larger high dimensional n by n matrix, which we can multiply with geometry representations to apply a certain transformation. Similarly, for generating other transformations, for example for hue shifting materials, we have another MLP that we train to create matrices for this specific transformation. And this is also how we create matrices to adjust the colors of materials. Using this type of a setup, for every type of transform that we possibly want to use, we need one MLP that takes that transform's parameters and creates this larger transformation matrix, which can be used to multiply the representations. Now, let's study this scene graph illustration a bit further. So here we first have a, a geometry representation for the teapot, and then we can apply some nonlinear deformation to it and then translate it. Then for its material, we can change the diffuse color using another transformation. And then we assign it to the object with concatenation. Then we perform the same process for the other geometric objects and the materials. And ultimately, by traversing this graph and applying different operations in sequence, we end up with a list of transformed objects and materials. And this is then much easier to give to a neural architecture, because instead of trying to invent a neural rendering architecture that deals with arbitrary graph structures, now we only need an architecture that can handle a variable number of inputs. To tackle this, we use a recurrent architecture. So for each material and geometry representation pair, we first use a deconvolutional network, which we call the preprocessor, to produce a feature map at the output resolution. And this is then given to a rendering LSTM to produce a new state. Then we continue this operation for each object in the scene until we get the final state, which we convert into the output image using a fully connected network. Let's now discuss how we train the network. So here you can see some example scenes from one of our datasets. In most of our datasets, each scene consists of a maximum of four randomly transformed and colored objects. So now let's go through a step of optimization using one of these scenes. Let's say our dataset consists only of cubes, teapots and cylinders. So then we have each of their geometry representations. The only materials we have in our dataset are these solid and volumetric materials with no textures. Each of these are represented with learnable vector representations. So if we now had a scene consisting of a cube with a volumetric material, then we would grab the cube geometry representation and the volumetric material 
and apply the desired transformations to these with the help of the encoders, and these then would produce the transformed representations. Then, if we also add the teapot with the solid material to the scene, we would grab these two vectors and transform them as well. And now we have two material geometry representation pairs that we can pass to the renderer. And this then produces the image. And like any other deep learning method, we backprop the loss through the renderer, the encoders, and finally the used vector representations. And this then optimizes the representations to be as useful as possible. And as you can see, in this case we do not modify the cylinder representation because it wasn't used in this particular scene. Now, before we look at the results, I want to first say that the following results are animations that were generated by a representation and the streaming renderer, simply by changing the dataset. And there was nothing resembling an animation in any of the training data, just random scenes. So, let's now look at the results. Here we trained a network on randomly transformed objects with this sandy beach ground plane and blue sky background. Then after training we can render animations such as this one with two Tori playing volleyball with a volumetric sphere. Here is another animation where we trained a network on randomly transformed 2D shapes, and then we can render this type of tangram animation with nonlinear deformations. And these uh, nonlinear deformations were also encoded using a separate MLP, specifically for this transformation. Here, each sprite texture was represented by a different material representation, whereas all the objects used the same geometry representation. There is still some inaccuracy, specifically with transparency, but the results are still quite encouraging. You can imagine this being used for some sprite game or something similar. A common challenge in neural representations is scalability. This means that networks cannot handle more complex scenes than seen during training. However, with our representation and the way we process the representations, we can handle larger numbers of objects than seen during training. And here is a video showing that. We can render this head geometry constructed out of 250 cylinders, even though the network has only seen a maximum of four objects in every scene during training time. Another challenge for many neural network models is generalization. So let's consider this problem. Let's say we have a specific type of material, which we only see on specific objects in our dataset. For example, if we want to extract representations from photos in the future, but still want to be able to apply a material to other objects which never appear with this material in the training data. So we tested this idea in a small experiment. We created a dataset where we have some primitives, and every primitive except the teapot can have this volumetric material. And you can see some examples of that data here. Surprisingly, after training, the model can still render teapots with volumetric materials, even though it has never seen them before, as you can see from this image here. And to prove that it works correctly, we also placed a torus behind the teapot, and you can see that in the prediction. This result is still quite encouraging, as it's seldom that neural networks generalize in any regard. So with that, to summarize, we have presented a neural scene representation which is intuitive to control and that can be used to produce temporally stable results just from training on completely randomized scenes without any temporal constraints. Additionally, it generalizes in some regard as we saw with the volumetric material on the teapot and it also scales fairly well to scenes with 50 times more objects than seen during training as seen with the cylinder head. The negative aspects are that we currently can only render simple scenes containing objects and materials seen during training. And another issue is that the lighting is fixed. Let's now quickly discuss future work. And well, there is a lot more that should be done. So first of all, the scene lighting is static. And one idea here could be to train on path trace data where objects can be turned emissive. And then we could make this an additional material. In this current framework, we're also limited to only rendering objects seen during training, 
because we optimize their vector representations from the data. But here one could possibly introduce an encoder network that takes a voxel grid, for example, and encodes it into a vector representation. In addition to this, it would be interesting to be able to extract material and object representations directly from photos. Another limitation that we have is we're using a fixed size for each object and material representation, but some of them might require more information than others. So here we could use 2D tensor representations instead. A simple solution to this would be to give more columns to objects or materials that will most likely require more information. Now a big open question is, how do you combine this with traditional methods? You could for example try using the representation to improve denoising performance, or maybe for inferring shading or global illumination, or maybe as a way to give the locations of light sources to neural importance sampling methods. In the supplementary material of our paper, we present another rendering architecture which should allow easier integration of the representation into existing neural models. And this should make creating hybrid models a bit easier, so please have a look if you are interested in it. So, to conclude, there is still a long way to go to achieve a fully controllable and high-quality neural scene representation, which can act as a bridge between traditional and neural methods, but we think this is a great step in the right direction. So finally, thanks a lot for your time. Please contact me if you have any questions.